This is a Shields of Shame exclusive. 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 Welcome back to another Shields of Shame exclusive. Have you ever wondered why cops are so poorly trained? Well, get ready to laugh and cringe at the same time, because this series is going to show you why. Imagine a bunch of GBI agents out on the town, drinking and driving in government vehicles on our dime, bumping uglies in parking lots, and acting like teenagers. But hold on, these aren't teenagers. These are GBI agents, supposedly held to a higher standard. You will meet not only GBI agents, but Department of Corrections officers and cops. This is a widespread concern, and the public should be concerned their tax dollars are being completely wasted. Some clues of why these agents are so poorly trained will be revealed in this series. Please consider supporting content like this by becoming a member. This case was swept completely under the rug. Until now, thank you and be sure to catch up with the playlist link in the description. Today's date is Friday, May 21st, 2021. The time now is 9.39 a.m. This is Director Fred Mays in the GB Office of Professional Standards. I am speaking with Special Agent Lucas Beyer. Agent Beyer, how long have you worked for the GBI? I was hired in September of 2020. Okay. And you were you sent to the GBI Region 10 office prior to going to the academy? Yes, sir. Um, following my hire date, I went through a basic mandate here at Gypsic, and upon completion of mandate, uh, which was December, I believe, we graduated on the, and the uh, December 11th, I believe, we graduated. Um, so I went to the Region 10 field office and worked there until um, until Basic Agent Academy started. Okay, so you're in the BAC now, is that correct? That's correct, yes, sir. Okay. You provided a statement um, back on May the 13th, dated May the 13th, of an incident that happened on May the 12th at the Academy involving Special Agent Kwame Rooks and Special Agent Megan Hirsch. And I have a copy of that statement and I'm going to make it part of the official uh, investigative file. Is there anything you want to change, add, or delete to that statement? Um, no, sir, not to my knowledge. Okay. All right. Briefly tell me, I can say I have your detailed statement here. Briefly tell me, you know, what happened that night. So we got out of, uh, as collectively the we, uh, the BAC class, we, we were dismissed from class uh, that afternoon. Um, I believe that there were some pre-existing plans for several of the uh, agents to go out to dinner that evening off campus. Um, I was invited to go with them. They said they were going to a Mexican restaurant. I'm not sure which one. Um, I declined the invitation, um, and I went and had dinner at the uh, logistic cafeteria with some other classmates that also remained on campus. Um, after dinner concluded, um, I did briefly leave campus. Um, I believe I left right around 6.15 in the evening. Um, I went to a local gas station, um, picked up a few, uh, few sodas, some snacks, and uh, also went to go uh, break some change um, so that I could use the laundry facilities here on campus. I got some dollar bills uh, transferred into quarters. Um, I returned to campus uh, very shortly thereafter. I made no other stops other than the gas station. Um, came back to campus, started my laundry, and started on some homework that we had. Um, Somewhere between 8 and 8.15 p.m., my roommate, Eric White, uh, he had gone out to, to dinner with, uh, with those classmates that I previously mentioned. Um, he returned to the room, um, and one of the first things that he told me when he walked back in the room was uh, that there had been a couple of classmates uh, that had had several drinks um, while he was out with them. Um, and the two that he mentioned in particular were uh, Cormier Rooks and Megan Hirsch. Um, he told me that, I can't remember his exact words, but I believe that the word that he used was trashed, um, just to describe their, how intoxicated that they were. Um, he went on to explain that um, Cormier had mentioned that he wanted to, uh, to 
go see his wife that evening. He wanted to drive off campus and try and go meet up with his wife. Um, because I was, uh, because Eric White had told me that Kumir was intoxicated and, and that he had also mentioned the intent to go see his wife, I was concerned that he may be driving a vehicle. So I called Kumir on the phone um, on his personal number. Um, that phone call was roughly 8.30, I'm not sure the exact time. Um, Kumir answered and he advised me that he was on campus and he was actually sitting up in the uh, main parking lot inside of a vehicle um, and he was still with some, some other folks that he'd gone out to dinner with. Um, when At the time that I made that phone call, I was in the dorm room of uh, James Richardson, who was uh, another BAC classmate. Um, James Richardson, I had the phone on speaker when I called Kumir, um, so James heard the conversation that Kumir and I had. Um, I could tell just by talking to Kumir over the phone that he was heavily intoxicated. Um, slurred speech and um, and uh, things of that nature. I could just tell that he was intoxicated. So uh, James Richardson and I went up to the main parking lot just to go check on him. Um, that was rough. That was a few minutes after the phone call um, that we, the two of us, went up to the parking lot. Um, and while in the parking lot, I saw. Um, I saw another classmate, Jason Cole, uh, who was standing outside of his, uh, his work vehicle, um, and inside of his vehicle were uh, Quimir Rooks, Megan Hirsch, and uh, Justin Jones, um, another classmate. Um, I approached the vehicle, and I was able to see uh, sitting on top of the uh, armrest in between the, uh, the two front seats. I saw a bottle of <laughs> what I believe to be whiskey. Um, and there was also a bottle of some kind of a Coke product, whether it was Coke or Diet Coke, I don't remember. Um, and I also witnessed um, Megan Hirsch and Kumir Rooks uh, drinking straight out of the bottle. Um, at the time that I went to the parking lot. Everybody was in a pretty good mood, um, laughing, joking. Um, I could tell that Meg, uh, Megan Hirsch and Kamir Rooks were, were definitely intoxicated. Um, I don't know if Justin Jones had had anything to drink. I didn't witness him drinking anything. I don't know. I didn't witness um, Jason Cole drinking anything. Um, but all the activity was going on inside of his vehicle. Um, I think I stood out there with them for roughly five minutes. Um, they offered me the bottle to drink from a couple of times. I declined. I had no alcohol. Um, and like I said, after about five minutes, I, I left the parking lot, returned to my room, kept working on my laundry and my homework. And um, at approximately... I want to say it was somewhere around 9 o'clock maybe, maybe a little bit later than that. Maybe, it may have been closer to 10. Um, I heard, I was laying in my bed getting ready to go to sleep, and I heard Megan coming back to her room. Her room was right next door to mine, and she was crying. I could hear that through the door. Um, she was heavily crying, um, and that got me... Um, out of bed. Um, Eric White was also in bed. Um, both of us got up out of our beds and uh, went to the door to go see what was wrong. And I observed several people standing around in the breezeway. Um, James Richardson was out there. Um, Jamie Kraft, another classmate. Um, Wilkes was out there. Um, trying to remember if I anyone else was out there. I believe that may have been all, everybody. At the, oh, Justin Jones is out there as well, kind of just out in the breezeway. Um, James Richardson was talking to Jamie Kraft about uh, Quimir being intoxicated. Quimir was Jamie Kraft's roommate. Um, 
So he was just letting him know, hey, make sure he's he's uh, ready for PT in the morning, make sure he gets up. Um, but then I think once everybody heard Meg crying and the, uh, the uh, attention was turned to her um, and trying to figure out what was wrong, and um, Megan's roommate um, opened the opened their door and told Eric White to come in. Um, apparently, from my understanding, Megan had asked for Eric White to come into the room so she could speak with him. Um, at that time, I had no idea what was what was being discussed. Um, I was not inside the room when that conversation was taking place. I basically returned to my room. Um, after after a while, I came back out of my room. Jamie Kraft, James Richardson, and Quimir Rooks were still out in the breezeway, and I could see Rooks was acting um, pretty aggressively, um, just wandering up and down the breezeway, uh, yelling a little bit. Um, I heard him make a couple of statements that he was wanting to fight some people. Um, couldn't understand why. I didn't understand why. Um, couldn't fully understand who he was saying he wanted to fight. Um, but he was uh, he was very plainly acting aggressively with, uh, with anybody that was uh, trying to engage with him, um, just trying to speak with him and, and tell him to calm down. He wasn't he wasn't having it at that time. Um, I kind of lose track um, of the, the timeline and all the events that occurred um, after that point. Um, but I know that Eric White was in was in Megan's room for for a while, uh, talking with her. Um, eventually, James Richardson was asked to come into the room and speak with Meg as well. Um, and once uh, once Richardson uh, James Richardson came out of their room, he started making phone calls to uh, to the training staff to advise them that um, apparently something had happened in the parking lot, um, and Megan had stated that it was a. Uh, from my understanding, I did not hear this directly from her, um, but apparently something had happened um, potentially of a sexual nature that she wasn't comfortable with. And um, so the call was made to the, uh, to the training staff um, to get some guidance and um, see if they needed to come back to campus. Um, and then the next several hours, um, seemed like it was uh, a couple of people, myself, um, Justin Jones, James Richardson, uh, Jamie Kraft. Um, we were all trying to, for lack of a better term, uh, try to contain Quamir, um because he was still acting aggressively, acting a little bit irrational, just shouting and um, trying to bow up on people. Uh, banging on people's dorm doors. Um, seemed like he was trying to yell at people through the door for whatever reason. Um, I, I still didn't have a full understanding of, of what was going on or why it was happening. I just knew that Rooks was, was acting out of the ordinary um, and Meg was in her room crying. Um, I did not see Megan Hirsch uh, anymore that night. I think she she pretty much stayed in her room with the, with her roommate uh, Karen Wilbanks, and um, it must have been it must have been around eleven thirty or, or midnight when I finally left my room again and went out uh, to try and speak with Quamir. Um, when I approached him, I, I saw that he was on the phone. James Richardson was out there with him. Justin Jones was out there with him. Um, James Richardson told me that Quimir was on the phone with uh, Carla, and uh, Quimir was pretty emotional at that time. Um, I could tell that he was crying. Um, eventually, that phone call concluded, and I approached Quimir, and I just asked him if he was, if he was okay. 
and at that time he he pretty much just collapsed into uh, my shoulder and just started crying heavily. Um, kept saying he was sorry and um, he didn't want to deal with anything anymore and he was uh, he was tired of it all and he, he kept making these statements. They were just general statements. He never really said anything specific. Um, he was just very emotional. Um, so uh, I just, I basically told him that we needed to uh, to get him inside uh, because it was cold out that evening. Um, I didn't mention it earlier, but uh, this when I went back outside, um, when I saw him on the phone, he was uh, he was standing out near the pond behind the dorm. Um, we were probably we were probably 100 150 yards from from his room. So I uh, I told him we needed to get back inside. Um, and I, I, I pretty much wrapped my arm around his shoulder, and uh, we started moving back towards the dorms. Um, he still was walking. Um, he, he couldn't support his weight. He was, he was walking like somebody who was heavily intoxicated would walk, uh, pretty uncoordinated at that time. And he was just very emotional uh, still. I was guiding him to the room. Um, to, uh, to James Richardson's room. Um, James told me that he had called Carla and that she was on her way down, and so we were just going to wait on her. Um, so I, I guided Rooks to his room. Um, we finally got him inside the room. He seemed to calm down quite a bit. Got him some water, and myself and James and Justin Jones kind of just sat with him for about 30 minutes until, uh, until Carla called and said that she was here. Um, when we were sitting with him inside the dorm room, he really didn't say anything uh, specific about the incident that occurred. I didn't. I didn't ask him about what had happened. I was just, at that point. I was just concerned with trying to get him to finally calm down and, uh, and relax a little bit, um, which it seemed like it, it worked after after talking with him for a little bit of time. Um, once once Carla arrived and uh, Rooks walked off with her. Um, I went to bed, and that was, uh, I want to say that was somewhere around 1 o'clock in the morning uh, where I finally got back into my room um, and settled down for the rest of the night. Okay. So let me ask you this, uh, Agent Byer. Um, when you went out to the parking lot with Agent Richardson and you saw them in the truck, uh, Meg Hirsch, Kwame Rooks, uh, it was James Cole and Justin Jones. Um, was Meg talking? Was Agent Hirsch talking? Um, and co I mean, said she seemed to be intoxicated. Um, yes. But was she talking? Yes, she was. She was talking. She was joking around with uh, with uh, Quamir and Justin. Um, they were they were joking and laughing. Um, seemed to be in a in a good mood all around. Um, they were just at least two of them. I don't know about Justin. I didn't speak with him, um, but Kumir and Meg, I I could just tell that they were they were intoxicated by the way they were talking and and their mannerisms. Um, I could tell that they were intoxicated. But yes, they were they were talking, conversating, joking. Um, did they seem more intoxicated than the? Or did they? Were they only two that seemed intoxicated that was in the in the vehicle? From my immediate observations, yes. Okay. Um, like I stated, I don't know if I, I didn't speak with uh, with Agent Jones, um, so I don't know if he was intoxicated or not. I didn't witness him drinking anything out of the bottle that I saw in the car, mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if he if he did or not during the course of the evening. Um, Jason Cole, um, I can't really speak to if he was intoxicated or not either. I think he may have been, but I, I don't know that for certain. Okay. From the time you and Agent Richardson was there in the parking lot witnessing them drinking and, you know, talking and have a good time until the time you got back to your room and then you heard uh, Agent Hurst crying, what time frame is that? How long did that ha take place? So I think uh, Agent Richardson and I, we... 
we got to the parking lot around 8.35, I want to say. I think that's what I wrote in my statement. I believe that I left. Richardson left the parking lot before I did. I hung out for, for another minute or two, um, just trying to make sure that everybody was okay. Um, so I believe I left the parking lot around 8.40 or very shortly thereafter. Um, went back to my room. Um, I believe I'm a little fuzzy. I think it was somewhere between 9.30 or shortly before 10 o'clock when, when um, I was laying in bed and I heard um, Agent Hirsch uh, crying out in the breezeway and, and go into a room. Okay. Um, did you ever overhear Agent Rooks? anything about what had taken place in the vehicle between him and Agent Hirsch? No, sir. Okay. All right. Okay, Agent Byer, uh, is there anything else you want to say before I turn the tape record off? Um, I, the only thing that I would want to say is the way that Agent Rooks was behaving that evening. I've known Agent Rooks um, before he and I were employed with the GBI. We worked with uh, Department of Community Supervision um, together. Um, we worked at the same office for a period of time. Um, so I encountered him on a regular basis, and he and I became friends. Um, but the way he was acting that evening is its completely out of character for, for any way that I've seen him act in the past. Um, I've never seen or heard him be aggressive with anybody out of turn like that before. It was the whole the whole evening was completely out of character for for him and his personality. Um, he's usually he's usually very very happy. Um, gets along with everybody. Um, and I'm not I'm absolutely not trying to make any excuses for for the way he acted that night. But it was it was just very surprising to see because it was completely out of his character. Um, so that's, that's, I think that's the only thing I just wanted to say. Okay. All right. Time now is 10.01 a.m. I'm going to turn the tape recorder off.